Um, go ahead, Irene. Great, okay. Welcome everyone. I'm gonna read the mission statement. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at this Helping Parents Heal meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome tonight, everyone. Thank you so much, Irene. And I first want to say that Ernie is, a, um, is one of the parents who was in Life to Afterlife, Mom, Can You Hear Me?, which was the first uh, documentary in the series, Life to Afterlife. He and his wife, Christine, were both in the documentary. Um, and I'll go ahead and read his bio as well. In 2009, when Ernie and Christine's son, Quentin, transitioned in an accident and immediately demonstrated that he still is, their view of a lifetime changed forever. Ernie's books, Quentin's Messages and Quentin's Legacy, share this divine knowledge. Ernie and Christine are both caring listeners for Helping Parents Heal. Ernie is an HPH board member. He also writes a monthly column in the Helping Parents Heal newsletter. Please read more about Ernie and Christine on their website, www.quintonsmessages.com. And Ernie is obviously um, someone who is very close to my heart. Both he and Christine were early members of Helping Parents Heal and they are located here in the Valley. They're in Peoria. They're also affiliate leaders in Peoria and we're very, very grateful to them. And um, without further ado, please welcome Ernie uh, Jackson and his wife, Christine, who's off to the side and might make an appearance as well. <laughs> here she is. <laughs> is Wonderful, <laughs> who is here. <laughs> well, um, it's an honor. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been a while since uh, we've spoken. Um, and let's just jump right in. Uh, we're no different than any of you. Um, you know, books aside, we've been through it. Uh, it was June 10, 2009. Our son, Quentin Stone Jackson, at the age of nine and a half years old, transitioned. And our life changed forever. Um, and to be totally honest, um, the ahas, uh, the things, be things began to change even before, uh, even before the accident. I, for one, um, was at a point that I was looking for something. I was, I was, we were preparing to go on our vacation, our annual trip, where I actually slowed down a little bit and spent time with my kids and uh, my wife. But I was, I brought up a notebook and I was hoping that something would come to me, some message to help me chart my path I you know and what I was thinking was automatic writing but I didn't know the term um, I didn't use that notebook for that purpose I use it for another purpose I ended up writing my son's eulogy in there and uh, writing uh, his obituary for the newspaper back in in our hometown of Evergreen Colorado but our, I mean, that wasn't the only precursor. I mean, I, and I'm a guy, I mean, look at me. I'm a, I'm a big guy, I got facial hair, I got no hair on my head, but I felt something. You know, I'm not a guy that feels much, but I felt change. And the words, I mean, the words sometimes don't carry a lot of meaning, but I felt change to the point that I cleaned up my office. I had a decent paying job, I had actually a very good paying job. I had no plans to leave my job, but by the time we left for our vacation, my office was empty of all personal effects. 
I just felt something was coming, didn't know what it was. And my thought was, I've got to do something. Let me clean up my office. Um, we also changed our vacation plans that year. It was 2009 and um, 2009, huh? 2009. And um, that was a year of the swine flu. And it was scary because we always went to Rocky Point down in Mexico, Puerto Penasco. And uh, the swine flu was, was, you know, creating some havoc down there. And plus there was some cartel activity and, and there was some killings. And our family, our loved ones told us we can't go because if we go, we're going to die. <laughs> Which is just kind of ironic. So, I mean, we changed our vacation plans to avoid death. You know, and again, that's incredibly ironic. Uh, there was a general level of apprehension before the trip uh, on the drive down there. We, um, we were just, we kind of felt like we were being pursued. We made it down while well, we changed our vacation plans and went to Lake Powell and, and got a houseboat and we had a great time. But Quentin was different. I mean, Quentin was, was really vacationing hard. He was having a good time getting like getting the last bit out of his time here in the physical, if that makes any sense at all. Um, but when he wasn't running around and, and climbing sand dunes and having a good time, he was very quiet. He was very reserved and spent a lot of time staring off into the distance. I mean, and it was unusual. That, that behavior was unusual. So I've just rattled off several different, you know, things that gave us indication that something was going on. Now, of course, at that point in time, I didn't think of it in those terms. I just, it barely registered, but it did register. But I really didn't know what was, what was coming. So vacation ended and it's time to, to go back. And, and my vacations are always, you know, I recharge. I dedicate myself to being a, you know, a better husband and a, and a better father and to spend more time with my family and to be more, you know, be more present, be more balanced. And I'm eager to get back and, uh, and give it another try yet again. Still though, on the drive back, it, it didn't feel right. Um, it just, we felt like we were being pursued. And uh, I'm, a, I'm like the typical person in the, the, the Western civilized world. We're in control, right? Damn it, we're in control. I'm in control. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna figure out a way to beat this. I'm pulling a, a jet ski trailer with two jet skis and the axle broke. And uh, we pulled off um, 30 feet off the road. I'm using an exact figure because they measured afterwards. So we pulled off 30 feet off the road and I'm kind of euphoric. I'm kind of like, great. We can let this damn trailer go. We're going to unhitch it. We call AAA. We, we call the owners of the trailer and the jet ski, and we're going to tell them that uh, Christine called them and to let them know that their jet skis are, are being Cortez, Colorado. And as soon as we're unhitched, I'm like, I'm six hours from home. I'll get us there. We won't feel like we're pursued anymore. And then it all changed. It all, it all changed. Um, I, was, I was moving some of the gear on the trailer to put inside the Suburban. Again, 30 feet off the road. Uh, I was at the back end of the trailer with my back facing uh, the incoming, oncoming traffic, the road. Uh, Christine had just gotten off the phone and she screamed in such a way that I never heard Christine scream like that before. It just, it shook me. And I immediately turned. Um, I just had the sense that I need to turn to see what she was seeing. Um, I had began to sense some noise or movement. Um, and I turned about 90 degrees and took an impact from a um, Pontiac Sunbird on my hip. Um, I walked up to those vehicles on the road and in the parking lot, if you will, and a bumper one of those comes to my knee. Um, this thing hit me in my hip, so it was about in the air 15 inches. 
and um, going fast enough to be that high in, in the air and hit me and launched me. And I told you we were 30 feet off the road. I was standing on the passenger side of our Suburban and, and uh, a jet ski trailer. <clears throat> so that tells you how far off the road she was. I traveled 18 feet in the air. The car went underneath me, sideswiped our Suburban violently, ripped off the passenger side door, and then the, the Pontiac Sunbridge drove over Christine. Um, it was airborne and bouncing. Uh, Christine saw all this coming and, and happening, but it was, we're standing still, this car is doing, I mean, how fast do you have to be going to be 15 inches off the air, off the ground? Um, hit Christine, it, it bounced up, trapped Christine under the car, bounced up, released her, and kept going off the road. And then I land to that nightmare, and it was just... I mean, surreal is not even, again, not an adequate word. Uh, there's dust everywhere. There's a bumper that I immediately recognized wasn't ours. I, I looked, I land face down. I look to my right and I see my wife's torn and twisted body. I immediately thought she was dead. Um, with us in the suburban is my daughter, uh, our son, Quentin my daughter's best friend, Layla, and my mother-in-law, Nellie Cano. Nellie immediately runs out to Christine and she's hollering and, and I couldn't even make out what she was saying. I think she wanted me to go over there. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what just happened. And I, I rolled over and I, I knew enough to check to see if I was missing any limbs. So if I needed to, I could apply a tourniquet and I wasn't. And I roll over and I see my son. And um, I, I drag myself over to him. I'm like, well, now he's with Christine. I've dragged myself over to my son and he's already gone, if you will. Um, his eyes are open, but his, his, there's no movement in his, and he's not blinking. There's no movement in the pupils. Now, of course, I don't know what that means because his body is still breathing. I think in hindsight, he was having an autotonic reflex where the, the, the nervous system keeps his, his lungs um, breathing, but he, he, was already, he was already gone. Um, and that was, uh, that was pretty tough. I mean, the toughest part was the dirt in his mouth. Um, that, that image came to me about 12 hours later when I would finally lay down to try to get a little bit of shut eye and, uh, that's the image that flashed in my mind. I'm like, nope, I'm gonna stay up. At that point, I mean, it was a that accident scene was a, you know, that accident scene was nightmarish. And I'm spending a little more time on it because I think most of you don't know me. And where this conversation is gonna go, I still want you to understand that we went through the tough stuff, and this is it. We're right in it right now. So if it's bringing you down, I apologize hold on a little bit. Um, my daughter had it the worst of all, Cheyenne. She was 16 at the time. She uh, stepped out of the vehicle and she thought her entire family was dead. Uh, I'm in the dirt bleeding. Christine's torn and twisted in the dirt bleeding. Quinn's bleeding and, and he's, he's, he's passed. Um, she immediately started calling 911. She's trying to get people to to come and stop and it's, you know, we had some good Samaritans who got involved. It took about 20 minutes for the, the first responders to get there. And then after that, probably another 15 minutes for the flight for life to get there. Um, I had a sense that God was there, if you will. And um, I wasn't a church going man. I wasn't at all. I had never read the New Testament, but I had a sense God was there and he poked me in my forehead and said, Jackson, you're not in control. And that was a bit of a gift as far as I'm concerned, because remember I started off talking about, you know, in Western civilized world, we all think we're in control. Eh, well, we're not. Um, the paramedics got there. They, they checked me out. They got me stabilized. They, they initially wanted to take Christine in an ambulance. Again, I, I did say this. I said, I thought she was dead. 
she actually died and came back. The paramedics didn't know if she was going to survive. So they were undecided if they put her in the helicopter and take her to, uh, I mean, what is it, like a class one trauma center that was in Farmington, or if they would take me. And I'm already on a, on a, on a, on a, on a flat, on like a gurney type thing on the ground with a neck brace. And I'm like, no, you're not taking me. I'm fine. You take my wife. And they did. So my wife's loaded up into the helicopter and taken to Farmington. I'm put into uh, an ambulance with Cheyenne, um, Nellie, and my daughter's best friend, Layla, and they take us to Cortez. And I'm, I've got road rash. Um, I'm, I'm bleeding from my head a little bit and from my legs, but I'm, you know, I'm there. <laughs> I start making phone calls and uh, we get to Cortez and it's just us, um, me, Cheyenne, and, and Layla and Nellie. And I'm like, you guys got to go to Christine. I don't want her to wake up and wonder what's going on. I don't want her to, I mean, at that point, we knew Quentin had transitioned. I mean, my mind was fighting it because he was breathing. But I mean, it, we got to a point, I looked over, there's a blanket over him. And I, you know, I laughed because I initially thought, oh, they're keeping him warm. I mean, my, I, was, I was still fighting it. I didn't want to believe it, but it finally began to sink in. And I told, um, I told them, I don't want, you know, I don't want somebody else telling Christine. Christine's got to know. So made arrangements. Um, Farmington's about an hour from Cortez. Made arrangements. I mean, I'm, at that point, I'm in protector mode, facilitator mode. And I think a lot of you will understand this. I'm trying to get things to happen. So I'm talking to the paramedics. I'm making arrangements for off-duty nurse, nurses to take Nellie and, and Cheyenne and Layla to go see Christine. And, and I'm, you know, I wanted to be alone. I mean, my world just turned upside down. I didn't want to be protector. I wanted to just be alone and, and deal with it. Um, Cheyenne, my, my daughter and Nellie, they got a ride and Layla stayed. I discovered afterward that um, Cheyenne told Layla, you're going to stay. <laughs> you're going to stay and, and be with my dad. Don't leave my dad alone. So they check out my wounds. They realize, you know, I felt some discomfort in, in my ankle or, or something like that. They did an x-ray. Um, the accident, and again, I'm probably going too fast. I apologize. The accident happened at 5, 530, 535, and it was uh, Wednesday afternoon on, uh, on June 10th. So I probably got to Cortez in, in an ambulance probably around seven, maybe ballpark, maybe a little bit sooner because um, the accident happened in four corners right there where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico and Arizona meet. So we get there and I actually called my, my sister and um, I had forgotten that call. Um, I was a mess. I was trying to hold it together, but I was a mess. She told me later what I said. I called and I said, my boy is dead. So that reality was, you know, that's heavy. You all know it. We have it too. I want you to know that we had it too, because I'm about to switch gears on you here in a little bit. So they released me at about eh, maybe 10. And I'm again, making arrangements. Y'all, I need a ride <laughs> to my wife. I need to get to her. She's alone. So our off-duty nurse takes myself and Layla down there and I show up and I get to the waiting room and I walk in and I have a bandage on my head. I'm still bleeding. Um, my daughter and my mother-in-law are in the waiting room. I immediately saw red. Why are they in the waiting room? I thought, why aren't they with Christine? Meanwhile, my daughter came to me in tears and she's trying to blame herself for the accident. And I'm like, no, I don't want to hear you say that again, ever. That's not what you need. That's not what we need right now. For you to heal, you can't be blaming yourself. You've got to let that go. <clears throat> again, you, know, you don't know me, but that wasn't something that would typically come out of my mouth before comes out of my mouth now it wouldn't have come out of my mouth before 
but it came out then. I don't know what it was. We can talk about it, but I wanted her to, I wanted her to heal and the healing needed to begin then. So I turn my attention to the, the door <laughs> into the ICU, which is locked. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm pissed, understandably so. I'm looking for somebody to vent my angst upon. I thought I had a nice opportunity to do so. I peek my head through the little window, I ring the bell, and I'm waiting to see what was gonna happen. I can only assume they knew who I was or the expression on my face, but they let me in. It's good, because I was gonna try to get in the way. Um, and I share that not for any other reason other than letting you know that I was beginning to grieve. Um, I had that too. I was angry. I was, you know, I didn't have a lot of it, but I had it in that moment. Um, I got to Christine. Um, Christine had been driven over the top of, flush torn from her back. Um, bumper had hit her in her head. Uh, they x-rayed every bone in her body. Um, they heavily medicated her. Um, she was able to look into my eyes when I got there. And again, I, she doesn't remember any of this, but I, I told her, you know what, we're going to get through this. Again, not something that typically comes through my mouth, out of my mouth at that time. Um, at that time of my life, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say more often than not, but uh, at that time of my life, sometimes the things I said weren't very helpful. <laughs> um, but at that time, things were beginning to change. It's funny how that happens. You know, you go through a life-changing event right in the midst of it, and for some of us, things begin to change that quick. I spent the night with her. Um, she doesn't remember. She still doesn't believe me when I, when I say that, <laughs> but I did. I spent the night with her sitting in the chair. Um, morning came and, uh, you know, people started moving around. Uh, Belly and Cheyenne came in. I went to go lay down um, because at that point I had, I hadn't slept in probably about 24 hours, I guess, ballpark. Um, Closed my eyes, and like I told you at the beginning, the first image was dirt in my in my son's mouth. Like, no, 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 no. Um, I just found out recently in the past six months or so, because that that image that that the dirt in my son's mouth only happened for a brief instant while we were at the accident scene, and then afterwards it was like miraculous. There was no dirt. I just found out within the past six months or nine months or so that Layla had taken the dirt out of his mouth, unbeknownst to me. And that's the kind of rock star Layla is. You know, you go through stuff like this and you, you, you meet people and people step up and become really strong and, and helping us in our time of need. So the journey was beginning from that point. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to be in control. I'm on my phone, which was a little Blackberry. I wore that thing out. I was calling everybody I knew back in Denver. I was um, letting them know what was going on. I called my one of my best friends in, in Evergreen, Colorado. Um, at that point, I, well, I wasn't at that point. It was a little bit later, I had a crutch. I had crutches because they discovered a blood clot in my leg, but I, I was kind of running from it, if you will. I was kind of running from it. Um, finally, are you ready? Finally, it was about, it was, it was at least 36 hours. Um, it had been at least 36 hours since I slept, maybe a little bit more. It was uh, about 11.30 that night. Um, at that point, it's Thursday. I finally get to sleep. And I'm there, I'm laying in bed. I'm in a room by myself. And my hand is being held. You know, my world had just been changed radically. I mean, I'm paying attention. I mean, I'm not looking for anything because I didn't know it worked this way, but I am paying attention to everything that's going on for me. And I'm alone in a room and my hand's being held. And I'm beginning to nod off, but I'm trying to make sense of, how is this possible? There wasn't gonna be a lot of that in the coming days. How is this possible? The best I could come up with at the time, because I really didn't know how it works, 
was, wow, that must be the manifestation of all the prayers. I actually said that to myself. That must be the manifestation of all the prayers. And I nodded off, but the accident had just happened. The word was get, just getting out. The prayers were just beginning. People were just beginning to find out. It took me several weeks to realize what was going on. It took me several weeks to realize it was Quentin holding my hand. And um, any of you here, you've got every right to say, really? <laughs> really? Wishful thinking. You're just hoping. You're just wishing. I had somebody call me on it. Eventually, it got on my face. She said, Ernie, come on now. Be real. Knock me on my heels. I'm like, you know what? Let me tell you why I know it was Quentin. Because Quentin has the softest hands. And we used to walk hand in hand. We all walked hand in hand with him. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to go hold my dad's hand. And eventually, even he <laughs> will understand that it's me holding his hand. And eventually I did. And wow, wow, what a gift. Again, I said it took several weeks for me to understand that. So I'm still in that mode of I'm annoyed. I'm trying to be strong. I'm trying to take control. I'm trying to, you know, connect the dots and get us back home. It was five days after the accident that something happened that changed everything. Um, the something happened is the reason I've written two books. The something that happened is the reason I'm here with you tonight. Layla's mom came down along with others, family and friends came down in this team, this group to lift us and hold us and help us in this nightmare. Um, after I left the lobby of the Marriott Courtyard one morning, I think it was a Sunday morning, five days after the accident, a medicine man in full gear walked up to Layla's mom, Chris, and grabbed her hands and looked her in her eyes and said, I've just finished performing a ceremony. A little boy sent me to find you. He wants you to know that he's fine. Somebody named Tom is helping him with his transition. Let the parents know this is all gonna work out. The settlement or a lawsuit or whatever though, I'm like, that's a lot of detail. <laughs> whatever that is, it's gonna take longer than expected, but everything's gonna work out. So Chris Baldrich hightails it to the, uh, to the hospital where we were and we had our support team. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but here we are in our lowest of lows, but we've got Uncle Jim and Aunt Troy and my mom, my sister. We got all this, this love around us and there's, there's moments of levity. And of course there's tears and it's just kind of a roller coaster. And when Chris Baldrige busts into, I mean, she busted into the room. She's like, get everybody together. I can only tell this once. And I thought, oh dear Lord, <laughs> what now? Where's our, where's our nephews? What's, what happened now? At that point, I was in my low. I wasn't in trying to be strong anymore. I'm curled up in a corner, imagining Quentin, imagining my son alone in the darkness. Not a happy thought. I was low. She busts in and told us what I just told you. Took my breath away. It literally took my breath away. I went from being on the ground to a sharp inhale, and the thought was, <laughs> Quentin's still alive. My son is still alive, and he loves us so much, he's got us a message. <sighs> These are just words, right? And goosebumps. I, I wish I could help you to understand what that feels like. I'm in my lowest low, I'm a blank slate. I have no idea this is how it works. I just know my son isn't here, he's dead, he's gone. And all of a sudden I discover out of the blue, that he's not, that he's alive. It changed everything for me. And my next thought was, why didn't I know? Why didn't I know? And from that point, I began to read. 
That was a big part of my journey. That sudden realization, wow, my son's still alive. Now let me discover how this is possible. Do you want to know what I discovered? There's hundreds of books out there that have been written. There are words written 2,300 years ago about this. There's hundreds of words written about this truth. Why didn't we, why aren't we, why aren't we taught this? I, just, well, I don't understand, but it's real. This is, this is our reality. Now, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? I mean, I know some of you in the throes of it. I was there. I mean, when you're heavy in the grief, you probably don't want to hear it. You probably don't want to see or hear somebody like me who might giggle and laugh at this knowledge, at this truth. I get it. But how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? From, from that point, I began talking. You know, and well, let's talk about grieving a little bit. I mean, I was angry. I, I had some fits of tears and bawled like a baby with the sun and all of it. I wish I had more. Christine had that and she had it for months. And I wish I had that because I still have tears in me that need to come out and they creep out of me <laughs> in the movies. And oh, I'm watching The Shack, watch The Shack again this week, watch Collateral Beauty again this week and the tears and I'm bawling and I still have more to get out. But, um, my grieving process was I began to talk. I would have to, I mean, immediately, people, those who had the courage to stop, come and stand with us in our time of grief. You know, the ladies, the women went to Christine and they cried with her and they held her and the fellas came to me. And, and come on, let's, let's be real. I'm gonna own how we are. <laughs> We're standing there in silence and, you know, looking at our toes and nobody knows what to say, but they were there. And I wasn't gonna let them be uncomfortable. I filled the silence talking about not only what had happened, but what the knowledge that pierced my consciousness. And as the days and weeks passed and the signs began, I filled the silence by sharing those signs because each sign was an epiphany for me. I was a blank slate. I didn't know how it worked. Each time Quentin sent us a sign, it rocked my world and knocked me on my heels and filled me with joy. And I had to tell the world. And so began my journey. I mean, I was on fire. I was on fire for the good part of five years. I would literally walk up to strangers. I mean, I'm not joking. I would literally walk up to strangers and tell them, Quentin's signs and how he visited, how the hummingbirds did these unbelievably crazy things. <laughs> how they would hover in front of Christine's face from you know 12 inches away. They had never done that before. Key phrase. Never done that before. How one tried to fly in the window, closed window, knocked itself out, knocked itself out on the uh, glass, went out, picked it up, rubbed it, and it came back and it went away how a deer was sleeping under our window, our master bedroom window. I bed it there every night for the better part of <clears throat> two months. Never happened before. It never happened before. How I saw Quentin in his bedroom. I saw Quentin, I was awake. I saw Quentin in his bedroom. I couldn't believe what I was saying. I saw he would walk across his bedroom from west to east. Quentin's not dead. One morning, I'm walking down the hallway, and he calls me out. Dad, I'm only one up in the house. Dad. And I joke, because I'm not that quick on my feet. I couldn't think of a thing to say <laughs> other than the acknowledgement of my son. Could have asked some questions, <laughs> but no. He just dead. He's just letting me know. Had my first dream visit. You know what? I say first, but maybe only. Dream visit four months after. And I, I think many of you have heard about these. They, um, they're different than a regular dream. I didn't know this at the time. Quentin showed me. 
I hadn't read all the, about, about this. I hadn't talked to anybody. I didn't know Elizabeth. <laughs> I discovered this on my own. Dreams are blurry and they're for forgotten. They're gone. A dream visit is different. It's like it's real. It's like it's really happening. Um, part of my process of dealing with the, the grief and the things I was feeling is I would get up in the morning early and go to the gym. I'm a former football player. I used to power lift and I, I guess 11 years ago, so I can still move some iron. And I'd go to the gym and I'd move iron to help me process the negative, heavy emotions I was dealing with. But this one morning at five o'clock, my alarm went off and I'm like, no, not today. <laughs> Laid back down and immediately my eyes closed and I found myself standing outside the east side of our house. We had a little sanctuary there, some grass, some trees, a memorial for my, my father-in-law. I'm standing there and at my feet, are the shadows from the deck above me, two-story house, the decks above us, the rails are at my feet. It must have been afternoon because otherwise the shadows wouldn't be the way they were. Um, in the shadows there is a hooded figure. I was pretty sure I knew who it was. I had to turn around. Really didn't expect to see him when I turned around. I fully expected I'd turn around and he'd be gone. Turned around. I saw him. I took his hood off. He had a buzz cut. He went from buzz cut to long hair, back and forth, back and forth over the years. He had a buzz cut. I could see the expressions on his face. He was surprised I could see him. <laughs> he was surprised I could see him. And he was eager because he knew <laughs> what was about to happen. Because I lost my stuff. <laughs> I got excited. And I started calling. I mean, I'm thinking it was all a dream. Quentin. As I call out his name, I begin to become conscious. Quentin. I'm closer to waking up. Third time. Quentin. He jumps off the deck. I reach my hands out. I wake up in the bed and I'm holding him. I feel him. This unbelievable sense of peace. Unbelievable sense of peace. Crystal clear. I tell you, friends, I love having that conversation with any of you anywhere where you walk up or you mention a dream that was unusual in its clarity. I will tell you, I know what that is. That's your son, that's your, that's your daughter, grandma, grandpa, anybody those unusually clear, vivid, like life. I just listen. I just got to get you talking and listen. Oh, it was, it was like it was real. Yep. I know what that is. That's your son. You know, you get to a point where you get to a point where we have a sacred obligation. Once you understand, once you get it, when tapped on the shoulder, you get to help somebody else get it. I mean, you know the deal. Um, when somebody's in the throes of heavy grief, words aren't necessary. Just wrap them up in a hug, hold their hand, just listen, just be there. And when they begin to talk, let them talk. When they start talking about unusual things, help them understand what they are. I believe we all get signs. You know, it becomes an issue of who do you have in your sphere on your team to help you understand what those signs were? Here, check this out. About three months after the accident, um, I'm making busy because that's what we do. We make busy, so we run from our emotions. We being us fellas, that's what we do. I know I shouldn't generalize, but generally that's the truth. Um, Joe and Ann Kector, and I don't know if any of you know their names, or who they are, but their son, Matthew, was killed in Columbine. And um, it was 1999. It was April 20th, 1999. They, uh, they went through it along with parents with 13 kids who transitioned that day. They ended up living not far from us. 
they come to the house, they're going to take Cheyenne, our daughter, out to take her mind off her new reality. And Joe peeks around the corner. Now, understand this. Joe and I hadn't talked. <laughs> he comes in cold, peeks his head around the corner with these big, sparkling blue eyes. And he says, have you seen anything strange? <laughs> Do you feel me? Do you feel me? Do you, have you seen anything strange? I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I have. And he said, enjoy it. It won't last forever. But the courage, the courage to walk up to me cold, not feel me, not look at me, not get a sense of where I was to ask that question. He took a risk and I met him there. We, um, we spent some time talking over the years and I just have to say this. Um, you know, we watch the news, we get our noses rubbed in it, right? Our nose are rubbed, rub, rubbed into the tragedy. We hear about these shootings, these school massacres and all this nonsense, but we don't hear the aftermath. Um, he said, Ernie, as, as a group of parents whose kids transitioned the same day, we would get together, all 13 couples. We get together and we talk about the, the heavy stuff. We talk about the heavy stuff, but more often than not, we, we talk about the signs our kids were sending us. Why isn't that on the news? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> what are you going to do with that knowledge? What are you going to do with that knowledge? What does it mean? I mean, first we have to grieve. We have to grieve. We have to process that heavy stuff. We have to cry and scream and run and hit the heavy bag or hit the pillow or we got to process that heavy stuff one way or another. We got to, we can't keep it locked up inside. Once our kids start to visit and you're able to acknowledge those visits, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Do you, are you willing to admit and say that, well, if they're sending me signs, that means they're not dead. They're not, they only transitioned. They only changed form. Are you willing to go down that rabbit hole? Are you willing to understand that and, and understand that they're immortal? They don't die. And that applies to us as well. Are you willing to go down that, that rabbit hole? Are you willing to go there? It's true. There have been so many books written about it. Brian Weiss. Love Brian Weiss's books. Messages from the Masters, Many Lives, Many Masters. Same soul, different body. <laughs> no, I same, was that right? Yeah. Same soul, different body. Michael Newton. Journey of souls, destiny of souls. Do you want to talk about reincarnation? Do you want to talk about soul contracts? I tell you, they're describing what we're going through. They're describing, let me read a couple quotes for you from, uh, from some of these books. This is Messages from the Masters by Brian Weiss. In truth, we are immortal beings who never die and are never energetically separated from those we love. We have eternal soulmates and soul families. We are forever guided and loved by guardian spirits. We are never alone. This is one of the books I first read. Journey of Souls by Michael Newton. If death were the end of everything for us, then life indeed would be meaningless. Soul contracts, our lives have purpose. We're here to learn and we're here to grow. I'm going to, I've talked straight for like 47 minutes. I'm going to shut up and let you ask some questions. We need to talk. Um, but uh, the human animal, us humans, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know if you have a different opinion, but I think most of us only learn through pain. Our tragedy, our struggles, our trials and tribulations, they have purpose. You know, there's that old saying, from who knows when, what doesn't kill us make us stronger. I know the pain. I know some people can't face it and they check out. And I beg you, please don't. This is where our learning begins. 
And because we're here together, we can learn it together and we can help one another. So thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Listen, I, I am so inspired every time that I hear you speak. And I want to tell you that one of the most exciting things about your story is the forgiveness that you showed at the very start of everything that happened. And I know that everything else is so important, but could you possibly go back mm -hmm. to the accident and explain yes. what happened on that day? For I everyone? apologize, I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. No, it's just something that I, I am always so emotional whenever you tell that story. Could you just, just let everyone know a little bit more about what happened that day? Yes. Um, please remember, um, at the time of the accident, I had not read the New Testament. I did not go to the Bible. I'm sorry, I hadn't read the New Testament. I hadn't gone to church. I didn't understand the word, if you will. I certainly didn't know what red print was. At the accident scene, something pretty incredible, something pretty magical happened. Uh, Amanda, who we've gotten to know, we've broken bread with. Amanda was the person driving the car that uh, took us out, that changed our reality after she took us out and went off. Well, she had fallen asleep at the wheel. She was a college student. She had a six month child at home. She was commuting back and forth from home and college. She was trying to get home and she was exhausted and she fell asleep. Even though it was a Wednesday afternoon on, on June 10th at, a, at about 5.35. Um, she did what she did, went off the edge of the area we were in and climbed up and and walked over. I mean, she surveyed this nightmare. Can you imagine? She ended up standing over Christine and, and talking to Cheyenne. And I'll never understand, you know, well, I do understand, but on a more material basis, where these words came from, from Cheyenne, she says, it's going to be all right. I wish, I wish my daughter could remember that now when she's having her struggles. <laughs> but she tells Amanda, it's going to be all right. I'm not party to that. I don't see any of that. I'm there with Quentin watching him breathe at, at less and less frequencies. She walks over to us um, and not a word is spoken. Not one word. I'm on the ground, blood dripping down my face. Quentin has his eyes open, lips turning blue. I look up at her. And she looks down at me and my heart broke. I saw in her eyes, I saw her pain. I saw her pain. I saw the beginning of her nightmare. She felt responsible. She was heartbroken. She, her nightmare was just beginning. She was living my nightmare. As a young man trying to deal, trying to cope, I drove with reckless abandon. I wasn't afraid to die. My only nightmare at that time at 16, 17, 18 was please don't let me take anybody with me. Please don't let me take anybody with me. That was my mantra. And I looked in her eyes and I saw she was living my nightmare and I wanted to take it from her. I didn't want her to we, um, we fought for her. Uh, she could have gone to jail for three years. Um, our efforts helped drop two of the charges. By the time we met her face to face, one year and 51 weeks later, only one year was on the table. We did our victim's advocacy statement saying, we don't want her to have any time. She's already been through hell. She's, we've learned a lot from this. She's gonna learn a lot from this. Please don't give her any time. Um, the judge gave her 10 days so she can know she served. So I met her, we met her at the court and she had carried that burden for one year and 51 weeks. She had lost weight, she had bronchitis, she had acne, she was falling apart. After sentencing, we asked the, I mean, we asked the victim's advocate and the uh, assistant DA if we could see her. You can imagine the, the look they gave each other. They're like, really? <laughs> Usually that doesn't go well. <laughs> Um, they asked her and she said, yes, at that point, she had an inkling of who we were. I already had my first Vimeo video out. I mean, I was already, you know, 
needless to say, understanding a little bit more of the bigger picture. She, uh, she was going to serve her 10 days immediately from, from sentencing. Um, she was saying her goodbyes to her family. We waited patiently. Um, she walked up with her hand out and I walked into her and I wrapped her in a hug and I whispered, I said, we've been worried about you. We spent time with her and her family that, that summer. Life is amazing, isn't it? You know what? And I, I mean, forgiveness is, I mean, I've spoken in, at the first conference and, and um, <laughs> it's, it takes a certain amount of insanity to get in front of a group of, of parents who are angry <laughs> and unforgiving and talk about forgiveness. Um, but I did. And, uh, and we had dialogue. And it was a great dialogue because I hate talking for my whole time and not giving you a chance to have dialogue. So I had an hour on these two sessions. I only spoke for 30 minutes and then I opened it up for Q&A and I had this amazing woman who got up and she's pissed. And she says, are you telling me that I'm supposed to forgive? And I shot right back, nope, I'm not. I'm just saying when you do, it'll help. I mean, that anger and rage you know what? That can f keep you going for a season. That can keep you moving for a season. But at some point, it's going to eat a hole in your gut. It's going to eat a hole in your soul. So at some point, it'd be nice if you could forgive. And it's not a race. And it's not about judgment. It isn't. It's about for your own peace of mind and your own growth. If it takes you 20 years, that's amazing. That's great. You got there. If it takes you 10 years, wonderful. If it takes you a year, great. If you, if you have to wait till next life year, night, next, next lifetime, that's fine too. There'll be another to work on that. Are there any questions? Oh, yes, Ernie, I'm sorry. I think that I wasn't muted and here I am <laughs> crying <laughs> off screen. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, you're always just so amazing, and I love hearing what you have to say. I, I, people are saying that your story is so amazing. Um, one, Andrea is asking how the accident happened. Could you just kind of clarify why she, she was going so fast and what happened? Um, I can't. Thank you. Um, the accident doesn't make any sense, so it's a really good question. We were 30 feet off the road. She was coming home. Um, I can imagine that she was kind of going the speed limit. I mean, she was, if she, I really can't say she was speeding. Everybody drives that road, you know, 55, 60. She um, came around a corner and on the corner, she fell asleep. She, she had the wheel turned when she fell asleep. So the car went off the road and she must have woken up and tried to correct but she's doing 55, 60 miles per hour on rough, hilly terrain. So I think she got the car straightened up and entered where we were. And we were in this big, I mean, I'm trying to be safe. Big, giant pullout. We're 30 feet off the road. She got into this big, giant pullout and she was doing 60. Couldn't stop. Bouncing. There's nothing she could have done. It doesn't make any sense. We were, we were outside the vehicle. Um, I was outside the vehicle, as I mentioned. Christine was outside the vehicle. Nellie, Cheyenne, and Layla were inside the vehicle. Quentin was outside the vehicle. He was where I would have told him to go if I thought something like this was going to happen. He was standing between the back of our Suburban and the front of the still hitched trailer. When Amanda got it straightened out, launched me she hit our suburban with so much force and sides that she sideswiped it the whole vehicle violently moved our son quentin must have had his legs up against the front of the the jet ski trailer got whipsawed into the back of the suburban i could see when i eventually saw the vehicle where his head hit and dented caved in the back of the suburban and then bounced back down onto the uh, trailer and that's where he got his, his gash. There's a little graphic there, but that's how the accident happened. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. It makes and, no sense, um, right? That accident makes no sense. 
it doesn't make any sense except that it was supposed to happen. Exactly. And we all know that. <laughs> um, Suzanne is asking if you've ever had a past life regression. Um, she's done with one with Dr. Weiss, actually. So have you ever done that? Um, not by somebody like uh, Dr. Weiss. Um, I did go through some regression therapy with friends of ours uh, up in, in Evergreen, Colorado. Um, and I, it's been a while, obviously, but um, one of the lifetimes, I was a monk. I was a head monk um, somewhere where there were lots of trees and I died a peaceful life. Uh, another lifetime, I was a big, burly Viking. Everybody respected me, but I had no authority. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would like to, I would love to sit down with a, a, a Dr. Weiss or, or somebody that's trained like that. To, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, yes. But at the end of the day, I, I at this point, I understand the lessons I've learned that I've imparted to you this evening, and I understand what I'm here to work on. Well, I can see you as a Viking. I can definitely see you as a monk, more than a Viking. Yeah. But I also wanted to just ask you a few more questions. Galen is asking, have you connected Quentin's silence that day with the accident? How, how it was that he was silent? The silence before the accident? Yes, exactly. Well, no, yeah, I, um, my thought is, and I, I shared in the first book, um, is on some level he knew what was coming. Um, and Quentin was a, the gentlest, I mean, was, I, I hate to say that he is the gentlest soul. He was a gentle soul in the physical life. He still is a gentle soul and perceptive and always worried about others. I mean, the things I could tell you about him checking on us, protecting kids who are being bullied. He's just that gentle of a soul. Um, I mean, I guess maybe he was connected in some way, but what the reason I say, I said it at the beginning of the presentation is because I think he knew what was coming. I think that a lot of times our kids know before we do that they're going to transition. And a lot of times they tell us that several times before they transition. And um, I think that it's something that allows us later on to look back on that and say, this was supposed to happen. There was nothing that we could do. And they knew it. We, we knew it ourselves. I, I knew it with Morgan his whole life that something was going to happen to Morgan. So um, it does allow us to understand that this wasn't something that we could do anything about. And we have to be able to let these things go because it was supposed to happen that way. And yeah, I mean, and I, I mean and there's only so much I could say in a, in a short period of time, but um, there were some things that happened. He had other exit points that he chose not to take and we're grateful, but that, that there were definitely two exit points pr pr previously. Jamie is asking a beautiful question. She says, can I please ask what it felt like when he held your hand? I often feel like my daughter holds my hand, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Well, um, I knew my hand was being held. It was a very, it was a physical sensation. Um, you know, the warmth, pressure, um, as I began to share, I met a woman and I shared this with her and she burst out crying because when she was 12, I mean, at the time I talked to her, she was probably in her late thirties. She said when she was 12, her mom had, had transitioned. And while she was in bed, she felt her mom holding her hands and she went to tell her dad and her dad said, Oh, stop that. Just don't, that's not healthy. Don't do that. So when I walk up to her all those years later and describe this to her, she bursts out crying and she says, thank you, Bernie. I, um, now I know it really happened. Just now I know it really happened. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Andrea is saying, do you hear from your son every day? Um, that, that's something that I suppose that um, we all want to know, obviously. You know what? Um, no, I don't hear from him every day, but I hear from him when I need him. 
Um, I hear from him when there's, you know, when there's a, a, a sense of turmoil in my heart and I, I need him. Um, you know, and, and recently he made his presence known and I think I, I wrote about it, Elizabeth. I was, uh, my daughter's not gonna see this. So I'll go ahead and call her out. I was on the phone with my daughter and uh, she's, she's still, you know, working the path. She's evolving, she has her ups and downs. And I uh, usually it's Christine that that pours her soul into Cheyenne, but this night I had the honors, and I'm pouring my soul into her. I'm talking her up and encouraging her and telling her she can do it. And the street lights started going off, and that's one of our we just uh, that's that's our go-to for Quentin. Um, and the strength of my emotion and what I was what I was trying to give my daughter Quentin jumped right in. He's like, I'm here with you, Dad. I'm going to give you some juice too. So it's, it's stuff like that, um, but I tell you, it's in the silence. Um, sometimes when I'm, I'm writing, um, those words aren't mine. Um, sometimes I get into a, I mean, he's there when I need him. Um, that's all I can say. I mean, it's, it's subtle. Well, that's, like, that's the message. It's not like, we want skyrockets, right? We want to know, it's like, boom. It don't work that way for me. It is subtle, and I've got to, quiet my mind. I've got to shut my stuff down so I can hear it. But when I need him, he's here. Well, and I don't know if you all saw last week's newsletter or last, actually last month, but it was a couple of weeks ago that it came out. He did talk about those, uh, those lights and he writes a column for our newsletter every month and every single article that he writes, he talks about Quentin. And so these are all articles that tell about those signs with Quentin and what they mean to him. And he's a beautiful writer. So if you haven't been able to see them, they're on the website. All of the cataloged newsletters go back um, 10 years, oh, wow. so you'll be able to see those. And they help so many people. And I just want, we, we don't have very much time, but I wanted to possibly bring Christine on if she can come on and just say a few words to everyone, because everyone's been asking about Christine as well. Maybe you could just say a, a short little part about your journey and what this has meant to you, because hearing about you being on the ground and broken and how has this changed you and what is your view now? Could you just tell people about that? Well, as a mother, you know, it's definitely life changing. Um, Quinn was a gift to us. We were not expecting him. I was told I had the flu. So when we found out we were pregnant with him, we had no idea that, you know, we had a child on the way. So he was a blessing from the day we found out. Having him every day in our life was just amazing. Um, like Gurney mentioned, there were two times prior where he could have exited and we were grateful that they did not, he did not at that point in time. He was here to teach us and we understand this now. You know, his short life, nine and a half years was so much more, so much more to us because what we have learned from them, I mean, it's, it has been life transforming for us as a couple, for us as a family and yes, you know, it was, it's hard. It's hard. We grieve, we cry. I miss him. I want him here with me. I want to feel him. Um, I've had the dream visits. I sense his presence when I need him. I talk to him all the time. I've had the mirror gazing, all these different techniques that they teach us about that nobody talks, uh, talks about on a regular basis, but we should because they're happening. Um, so I've had these experiences. And I know without a doubt, my son still is, you know, like Ernie, he tries to get the point across, dead people don't send signs. They don't. That's why our children are so much alive because they're trying to get their signs across to us, to make us aware. We need to live so that they can thrive and we can thrive. The accident was horrific. I was not, you know, like Ernie said, I, I died, I came back. I believe my son's spirit brought me back that day. He lived in me. He lives in me every day. You know, I was determined to get better, to be better. I walked out of that hospital in six days. No, not one broken. Well, actually I had five broken ribs, but I was able to walk out of that hospital. 
many months of recovery. The grief journey was, was and is, you know, and every day. The forgiveness journey was completely different. Where Ernie was able to forgive immediately, it took me just about two years. And it was eating me alive because I couldn't forgive and I was so angry with myself. Being a forgiving person, it was eating me alive, but I did it. And I'm so grateful because again, at that point in time when I realized I need to let this go for me, make amends with it. I know my son is with me. I know and I want better for Amanda and for her six month old child at that time, actually he was gonna be two, two, uh, two and a half at that time, I wanted better for her. And she's now a part of our family. We recognize her, we've gotten together several times, just that whole healing process, again, transforming for all of us. So while the, the journey of grief and the loss, you know, of our loved one has been difficult, we're so grateful and thankful for having Group, a group like our group, Helping Parents Hill, to help us through this process. So I, I'm just so grateful for Elizabeth. Um, and like my husband, you know, he's, he's determined to get the message out there to anybody, everybody, whoever will listen, hear us. We just wanna help, that's all. We're just like you all. We're in the same boat, just a different journey, different journey. Well, I just want to say that when you and Ernie walked into the room the first time that I saw you at the Logo Center, you were like these two huge bright lights walking into our meeting. It was just incredible. And you have been those bright lights ever since. And I feel so grateful that you're both in my life, that you are leading a group in Peoria now. And unfortunately, we have those meetings on hold for now. Um, I see Janine on here, who's also been able to have you speak at her group up in Flagstaff, which is just wonderful. You've spoken at groups in Tucson. I know that when there's an accident in Payson, you'll take the car and drive four hours or five hours up to Payson to see the, the parents who have had a car accident and, and tell them that it's going to be okay. And I feel so grateful that you are that type of person that realizes that we heal by healing others. Absolutely. And this is, this is probably the biggest message that I think that Ernie and Christine can give us, not only of forgiveness, but also that we can heal by healing others. And so I am truly grateful to both of you. Um, I, I want to just let you know that um, this this will be also on YouTube. Please be sure to make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so that we can get the word out to as many people as possible. The more people who subscribe, the more that people will know about this. And, um, and I, well, I wanted to just ask one last question, and I know that this is kind of silly. One person is asking about mirror gazing, and I, it, it might be way too difficult to get into this, but if you want to talk about it, Christine, just so that, um, so that people know about it, or I could just kind of give a little description about it. I, you can give a description of it because I didn't know what <laughs> was happening to me. I am a person who uses several mirrors when I get ready, whether it's doing my hair, my makeup, what have you. I am, you have a, a forward mirror and a couple of side mirrors. I got to see the back of my hair. So I have lots of mirrors. And I was seeing, seeing things in these mirrors. And I later told Ernie about it. And then we were later at a meeting at the Logo Center and we're discovering what this is. Ernie's giving me the knowledge behind it. Elizabeth is confirming what is, has happened. And I was like, and I put it all together. And it's like, well, that's my son. Yeah. He's trying to, he knows that I'm into my makeup and my hair that that would be the perfect way to get to me. Well, actually, Plato wrote about it 2,300 yes. years ago, and then yes. Rick Moody wrote about it in, in one of his books. And I yes. think, um, I mean, and I don't know the exact specifics, but I think in reading a little bit about it, you, you look into a mirror um, indirectly. It might be during dim light, maybe have a candle nearby. Um, Christine, she just went a whole hog and had like five mirrors, but she didn't know what she was doing. But um, 
as Reverend Rudy wrote and Plato wrote, sometimes you can see your your loved ones in the in the mirror, but it's with an indirect gaze. Mm -hmm. It's not a you have to soften your eyes if that makes sense. It's an indirect gaze, and it you know it takes practice and patience like anything else. Um, I, I just want to say that I I actually did it in India in the very beginning, and I was doing it without realizing what I was doing. And this was before Morgan was born, and I. I saw Morgan gazing back at me, um, but the same age that I was when I was in India, I didn't know what this was. It totally freaked me out, but I knew later that that was him. And so Raymond Moody, the reason that I'm asking you about this is because Raymond Moody is going to be speaking to us on the 21st of May. And I'm hoping that maybe he'll talk about this. Unfortunately, his parents locked him up um, when he was doing this mirror gazing, he had learned it because of Plato, as Ernie explained, and he was practicing it because all of these Greek philosophers did this mirror gazing to be able to connect with people who had passed. So it's a way, it's one of these, one of these things that we did in our meetings because we want to learn about all of the ways possible to connect with our kids. That's the most important thing about this group is figuring out ways that work for you, whether it be through yoga, through meditation, through mirror gazing, through energy healing, through mediumship, through all of these different things. Um, there's always one way that works easier for, the, for one person. So anyway, thank you both for being here. Um, if there are any other questions, everybody's writing such nice things to, to both of you, and I'm hoping that you're able to see them in the chat box as well. Uh, and I see down at the very bottom EVP as well. And, um, and we'll definitely see you hopefully on Sunday. We have Ann Albers, who's going to be speaking to our group at one o'clock uh, Arizona time, which means that it'll be four o'clock in the afternoon in um, on the Eastern coast. So anyway, thank you all. Please go ahead and unmute yourselves and say thank you to uh, Ernie and Christine. Thank you both. And thank I know that we'll see you guys soon. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Ernie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.